hopefully you'll get some personal gut level experience with what bioethics is. Medical ethics can be traced back thousands of years, at least to the time of Hippocrates, if not before, but bioethics as we know it today is young. It dates back to the 60s and the 70s, which as we know is not a particularly calm, peaceful time in our nation's history. Uh, there were all kinds of difficult policy issues, like how we should allocate scarce resources. Um, there were emerging research scandals, including but not limited to the Tuskegee syphilis study. There were radical changes in medical technology, uh, leading to tough cases like that of Karen Ann Quinlan, who was a woman in a persistent vegetative state whose family wanted to take her off a ventilator. There were also scientific discoveries, like methods for manipulating DNA. And all of this has played a part in the development of what we now call bioethics. In the decades since, technology has been advancing even more rapidly. Our concerns are getting even more global. And the new questions we face about science, medicine, and technology are more interesting and more thorny. But in some ways, they still haven't changed. <coughs> the questions include, should we? Is it safe? Is it fair? And does the benefit outweigh the risk? Plus, does our opinion on these matters change when the outcome affects us directly, as opposed to someone we don't know? So today, you're all going to be the bioethicists. We'll present you with scenarios. You'll be asked to make decisions using your little clicker. Uh, those clickers will let you vote. And you may have seen on the invitation to this event that you should be prepared to squirm. So I hope you're prepared. <coughs> The scenarios we'll be looking at will be hypothetical scenarios, but the issues are real, and the faculty at the Berman Institute tackle these issues every day. We're lucky to have four of them who will be joining us to walk through the issues and ethical principles involved. And maybe after listening to them, you'll change your mind about how you would have voted. So I'll introduce them after we dive into our first topic, which is allocating scarce medical resources. The term death panels has become well known through its use in political struggles over health care reform. The political misuse of the term death panels distracts from real life and death allocation decisions that are made every day. One of the most familiar involves organs for transplantation. In the US, we use a nationwide network divided into regions that rely on assistance from transplant centers to match donated organs with the most suitable recipients from waiting lists. Allocation is based on criteria, like blood type, tissue type, size of the organ, along with medical urgency, how long a person has been on the waiting list, and the distance between the donor and the recipient. There's urgency, but patients can still be carefully evaluated. You know, we have a list. Think about the aftermath of disasters. That sort of careful evaluation isn't possible. Lots of life or death decisions have to be made quickly. So who should be responsible for allocation decisions in a disaster? And what criteria should they use? What values are most important in making these decisions? These decisions will have a direct impact on who will live and who will die. The worst public health disaster on record is the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. It actually began in 1918. It hit one third of the world's population at that time, so about 500 million people. Total deaths have been estimated at 50 million and may have been as high as 100 million. Since 1918, we've had frequent reminders of the threat of another deadly flu pandemic. We've been warned about swine flu, bird flu, other diseases like SARS. In the event of a flu pandemic, we would quickly run out of stuff. Vaccines, medicines, beds, personnel, everything. But let's focus on mechanical ventilators that assist people with breathing. Flu patients can develop severe pneumonia. Without a ventilator, these patients will likely die. And in a pandemic, we simply will not have enough ventilators. It's unavoidable. Ventilators are expensive, and they're not well suited to long-term storage. While there is consensus that another pandemic is likely, the timing is unpredictable. It could strike next year or 100 years from now. So imagine, it is February 2016. 
a new flu strain has appeared around the world. People are streaming into emergency rooms with high fever, confusion, shortness of breath. By the last week of February, the deadly new flu is hitting Baltimore hard. The state of Maryland reports that its entire stockpile of emergency ventilators have been given to hospitals. Two patients are simultaneously wheeled into the emergency room at Johns Hopkins Hospital. The hospital has one ventilator available. On a quick exam, both patients are similarly quite ill. Both have similar prospects for survival without the aid of a ventilator. And both, both are, have similar prospects for survival with the aid of a ventilator, and both are unlikely to survive without the ventilator. One of them is Susie Baker. She's an eight-year-old girl whose parents have brought her in. Then there's Bob Clark. He's a 63-year-old man brought in by his wife. A decision needs to be made now, or both will die. So here is your question. Who should receive the ventilator? Susie or Bob? And Bob Clark is 63. But there's no other medical history. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> well, we need to have to make a decision. <laughs> you don't get it yet. <laughs> it's chaos in the ER. How many are there? <laughs> All right, so you guys pick Susie, basically. <laughs> So who was it who wanted more medical history? Here you go. Hospital staff learned that Susie has the gene that causes Huntington's disease. A fatal disease with no treatment. Her prognosis is uncertain at this point. She may not live to adulthood, or she may live beyond Bob's current age. The most likely answer is in between. They also learn that Bob is a doctor who spent long hours treating patients affected by the flu pandemic. Even though with treatment, he's unlikely to be well enough to offer any more medical assistance to the patients anytime soon. So now you have this additional information. <laughs> <laughs> Who should receive the ventilator? Susie or Bob? Is there any more medical information? <laughs> <laughs> this is it for now, yeah. <laughs> Emergency situation. <laughs> Conditions are less than ideal. Everybody voted? Professor of Biomedical Ethics and the founding director of the Berman Institute. We have Jeremy Sugarman, who's the Harvey M. Meyerhoff Professor of Bioethics and Medicine, Professor of Medicine, Professor of Health Policy and Management, and Deputy Director for Medicine of the Berman Institute. We have Nancy Cass, the Phoebe R. Berman Professor of Bioethics and Public Health in the Department of Health Policy and Management, Johns Hopkins New York School of Health, Public Health. 
and Deputy Director for Public Health of the Berman Institute. And then we have Jeff Kahn, the Robert Henry Levy and Ryda Hex Levy Professor of Bioethics and Public Policy, and the Deputy Director for Policy and Administration of the Berman Institute. So I will head over there, and hopefully this mic will work. But before I ask the panel, does anybody want to share any of your logic on how you made the decision? So first question, Susie versus Bob. Anybody want to share how you made your decision? Youth. Just shout it out. Years Youth. of potential life loss. Youth and years of potential life loss. Is that? And so why did things change when suddenly we learned Bob was a physician we've been treating since pandemic? Amber said something. So that was the key thing, that she had Huntington's disease. Now let me ask you a question on that. Do we know that, or do we really know she has a parent with Huntington's? It would be a 50-50 if she had a parent with Huntington's. She's got it. <laughs> Although why we know that is beyond me, though. <laughs> yes? Uh, it seems we should know whether who got the first ventilator before you decide who will the second, uh, you know, the second question. So the second question about whether to take a ventilator or Take it away, yeah. Who, who got it? That seems to, be, seems to me you should ask that question. Uh, all right, well, let's see what the panel says. Does anybody want to jump in? What do you think? <laughs> How about you, Ruth? Well, um, so I, I'm going to go right, right to the, the, the difficult one, which is whether to remove the ventilator from the patient who's already on it. We actually have been running a project, working at Allen, we've been doing this for, what, two years now, where we've been taking essentially these scenarios out to different community groups across the state of Maryland to essentially get from people in the state what they think we ought to do in terms of guiding principles because this scenario could happen. And in fact, we began working on this project uh, when we had what looked like a pretty bad pand pandemic several years ago that turned out to be not that difficult. And the issue of whether to take someone off the ventilator knowing that they will die as a consequence is always the one that stops the conversation and where people have the most concern because it runs against all of our conventional understandings of what physicians and nurses are supposed to do. Right? Physicians and nurses are supposed to heal or help or relieve suffering, <coughs> but they're not supposed to take a life that has yet some time left. The problem here is that this patient, the patient with cystic fibrosis, is in end stage, is likely, very, very likely to die while occupying that ventilator for the duration of the pandemic. When patients need a ventilator because of an acute influenza, even a severe one, they only need it, say, for four or five days. And then that ventilator can be free for another patient. So part of what we need fully flesh out in that scenario is we need to think about this. It's not just a life for a life. It's that person's life being cut short in order that perhaps five, six, seven, eight, ten, we don't know how long this lasts, other patients will survive. And I need to stop. So there, there are at least two, uh, <laughs> two separates like a game of dominoes. Yeah. We'll get it right by the time we get to <laughs> <laughs> So, so there are two pieces here. So from a bioethics perspective, one thing we want to look at are, are two pieces of information that we've been talking about at the same time. The first is what are the obligations of physicians and the withholding or withdrawing of something like a ventilator. And the second piece of this story that's interesting is the justice question or, or the fairness question in a setting of, of scarcity. right? And so the initial reactions that we have... It's are, also a legal question. Right, so they'll be legal, but I'm, I'm just from the ethics perspective here, the piece that we respond to is, is what do we do in the situation where someone is in the need of a ventilator? Is it morally acceptable to either withhold that ventilator or to withdraw that ventilator? And for the early times of bioethics, people actually put out this claim that withholding or withdrawing a ventilator in a situation like this are morally equivalent. They're probably not. And they're probably not, but they are very similar. It can be morally acceptable to withhold, and it can be morally acceptable to withdraw. 
Actually, when all things are not an injustice situation, it's probably better to put someone on a ventilator, let them try it, take the emergency away, and take some time, not like a clicker, to get the medical history and think about it, and to see how somebody responds. It, is, it can be morally acceptable also to withdraw, either because the person's decided that they are no longer getting something out of it, it doesn't meet a medical need, and what this case pushes is this justice question. So I think it is important to tease those apart, and it's why the clicker exercise is unfair. <laughs> so let me pick up on one thing from where Ruth and Jeremy were going, and then maybe add one more. Um, it seems that However agonizing this was for all of us, it's got to be logarithmically more agonizing for that physician who's staffed in the ICU without sleep, without food, all those kinds of things. And um, the reason why I say that is that it seems like in ordinary situations, ICUs sometimes start to develop their own rules, their own internal policies, their own systems, even if it's just within a given ICU, for what makes sense, what's fair. And in this context, to do the same would make sense because it ought not be up to that single physician who's been working there for 18 hours to make that decision about Chris. But if the ICU has started to say, look, in the context of a pandemic, we need to evaluate um, medical futility or medical likelihood of benefit, and we're going to have a policy, then we can even let the families know that. And being able to say that um, makes it easier potentially for a lot of people. The other point I wanted to make gets back to maybe an earlier piece. Um, obviously, if we had even more time, it would have been interesting at stage two to separate the impact of Susie having Huntington's from the 63-year-old uh, whose name I can't remember. Bob. Bob, Bob. thanks. <laughs> so not, why didn't I remember Bob? Um, uh, I care about him. <laughs> 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 no, so to the contrary. So, so I would say I'll, I'll put out, you know, instead of just interesting talking, I'll put out something that's important to me. To me, it is morally quite relevant that Bob had been willing to put himself at risk. And it seems to me that we're going to need a lot of people in the context of emergency to put themselves at risk. Certainly healthcare providers, but arguably the person who's willing to make a delivery to the house of the person who has flu, and nobody else wants that responsibility. And it seems like our willingness to make a commitment to the people who are willing to go the extra mile and put themselves at risk, that at very least will take care of them when they get hurt is more relevant. Well, I have something to ask, but first, Jeff, did you want to say something? Well, yeah, of course. You know, <laughs> give me a microphone and, and a few minutes, and I'm, I'm happy to say a few words. Uh, I want to actually um, come back to something Ruth said, which I thought was really interesting about uh, we can take one person off a ventilator and save some number of lives, which appeals to our um, utilitarian ways of thinking, which we often look at as a kind of answer to policy questions. Um, but it's not that different to, I'm going to be provocative here, maybe it's not that different than how we've thought about organ transplant, where we say, look, that person is occupying a body effectively when they're, the person has gone. And if we could define them dead before the old way, when their um, heart stopped beating and they stopped breathing, and talk about it from the perspective of brain criteria, we could harvest their organs uh, and save many more people. Now, I'm being provocative intentionally, right? How is that a different scenario than saying, you know, Chris, you, you're at the end of a, of a terminal disease, and a few more fill in the blank days uh, aren't going to make a big difference to you, but we can save multiple lives in the in the process. That's a very challenging thing for us from a perspective of ethics and, and a public policy perspective, but that's sort of where the scenario as you painted it feels like it's leading. Well, let me ask you this question, which gets to this sort of utilitarian thing. I think the first question was based simply on age, you know, a little girl versus a middle-aged man. And it seems like most people picked the younger person based on youth and this idea of more years to live, potentially. <clears throat> what do you all think of that as a criteria for making this type of decision? What, uh, what we've been doing when we've been taking this out to the communities around the state of Maryland is actually putting before them, before people all over the state, seven different candidate principles for making 
making determinations about what to do in the pandemic. In order to develop, hopefully, eventually, statewide policies of exactly the sort that Nancy is describing. So the one that has to do with age actually has uh, a name that has its roots in a Britishism. It's called the fair innings principle. It's like in baseball, but it comes from cricket. The idea is that one account of justice would hold that everyone ought to have their shot at fair innings, whether that's nine or seven, before anyone goes further. So it's an argument that would favor young people in a crisis and a tragic choice kind of a situation on the argument that someone who's lived five decades or six decades or seven decades has already had the opportunity to experience those stages of life, whereas someone who's younger has not. The counter to that is twofold. One is the argument that all you have left in the end, no matter how old you are, is the rest of your life. So think about that for a moment. No matter how old we are, even if we're in the eighth or ninth decade of life, what we have left is the rest of it, however long it is. And for many people, especially people who hold a certain sanctity of life, you, that's the more important consideration. By and large, however, the fair innings argument is found by many of us to be more compelling. It also has a utilitarian, if you like, although I hate using that label, uh, analog, which someone in the audience mentioned, which is the numbers of years of life that are saved is more if you go in the direction of a younger person <coughs> most of the time, not always. So obviously when we learned that this little girl also has the gene for Huntington's disease, it's possible that she may not live as many years as we would otherwise credit a seven-year-old or eight-year-old with. So that's uh, the formal way in which we think about that consideration. Hopkins is very research-oriented. Let's throw in another issue relative to that. Huntington's disease could be cured in that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I said, or treatable. So even if you say not cured, but something could be done to extend the productive life of somebody with the disease. Um, I, I think there's a, an interesting a way to think about what Ruth just said that it cuts against the argument that you made, which is on the argument of um, life years saved, uh, you would say let's treat the less sick people because the same amount of intervention could actually save people who are less severely ill or provide more life years saved. So we, we have to be, it's a, it's a more nuanced, right? standard of thinking about when the right uh, individual uh, shows up to get treated. And that's a big consideration in who should get kidneys for transplant, for instance. And if I could just follow that really briefly, one of the complicated features, and, and in fact, when we try to make these triage decisions and set the policies for them, we try to get, we presume we can get some basic medical information about at least some of the people, is this question of comorbidity. So people who will get sick in a in a pandemic are not all going to be 100% healthy people before the pandemic. Many of these people are going to have other medical conditions which will complicate either their chance of survival of the pandemic, but even without that, whose lives are going to be foreshortened probably because of the other medical problems they've got. When we started thinking about whether, in line with what Jeff was saying, we ought to therefore include some sort of an algorithm that adjusted for comorbidities and therefore essentially adjusted for life expectancy predicted on what all the other reasons that people might be um, at risk for an early death. We began to kind of smack into the reasons why some people often are at increased risk for early death and many of those are related to poverty and social disadvantage. So imagine where Hopkins Hospital is and think about the justice implications of essentially reducing a person's chance of getting a ventilator based on diseases and illnesses and behaviors that are often very tightly associated with poverty, poor education, 
discrimination go down the list and took a judgment. One position is anyway that from a social justice ground, this would be arguably unacceptable to fold in, but it's something else to think about. Is this not um, a restatement of the lifeboat cases? The English and the American lifeboat cases were basically you're stranded at sea and the decision making process uh, has to be engaged in as to supply on what those supplies exist. In some cases, uh, I think it was a, a 40 that uh, took the responsibility as to who would go overboard. question I had, which is, you talked about developing policies and this idea of the overworked position in the intensive care unit, people are streaming in, it's you know chaos, and there's not enough anything, there's not enough medicine, beds, ventilators, and so this person is having to make these decisions, and you talked about making policies that would then hopefully guide these decisions so that they're not just sort of made in the heat of the moment. I guess my question is, um, is that actually workable? Does that actually work? I mean, if you make these policies, do people pay any attention to them in a disaster? Well, I mean, you know, the short answer is I don't know. But, um, and, um, but here's my thought. My thought is that if um, someone, I, in this case we're talking about a physician, an ICU physician, if that person in charge of the decision feels like the policy is deeply morally flawed, they won't and they ought not follow it in the same way it would be true if there was a policy related to something else in the hospital. But I actually think that the advantage of policy is helping to call a decision when the moral tension is so close that a variety of decisions would truly be justifiable and to allow a little bit more time to think about it, right? So in the moment, somebody might really be thinking only about age eight versus age 63. And when the policy forces you, forces you to look into the degree to which somebody already is responding to a ventilator and take that into account so that maybe you can solve the problem not by deciding between Bob and Susie but by giving a ventilator to both of them, um, it potentially can be helpful. So fortunately we don't have to encounter these situations on a regular basis. But we approach a lot of analogous situations sort of commonly in medicine and medical practice. So the organ transplantation issue about how, where the organs go to is similar. We sometimes face uh, shortages of chemotherapy for children. We face shortages of different um, drugs uh, on a regular basis that come out of the fact of how what, what provides incentives for drug production. And we face these issues. And we have adopted policies that are based on a variety of considerations. One are these sort of utilitarian considerations. What are the relevant laws? What are the relevant features of the case? Can people be cured? Does it work? And, and in depth, so that the person who's tired, whether they just started their shift or they've been on for 18 hours or whatever it is, has at least an articulated format to at least respond to. How ought I make these decisions? Now, they may rebut that by some compelling situation. What we want to avoid, I think, is the sort of idea of a plebiscite where we simply decide that, gosh, Susie's really cute, let's save her, right? And that, that there's, there is nothing, um, as an econo economics professor I had in college once said, there's nothing more democratic than a lynching. And um, we just don't want to get the ugly folks off or whatever the situation is. And, and I think giving us the tools to pause and to be able to say, this is a way of thinking through these problems. These are relevant considerations can be helpful. The piece of getting public engagement is sort of the state of where we are in the world about lots of things, right? We get an engaged public, we elicit opinions, and, and it's really valuable for informing sort of expert intuitions. Just if I put my white coat on, I might look smarter today, but I wore this because I'm clearly not smart today. Um, you know, what, what, what is the expert role is countered by public roles, very critical. But also getting a truly good policy will um, get the inputs of the people who actually be on the front lines making those decisions. Because there is something in the case of withdrawal that feels different, even if it's morally okay, than providing a ventilator. I can tell you that any time we take a ventilator away from someone, it is not an easy task. And we don't want it to be an easy task. 
Um, but that's the case whether there's scarcity or not scarcity. And so uh, that's why I argued a little bit earlier that we have to tease those apart. Uh, do we have time for one or two questions? <coughs> Let's have two questions and we'll move on to the next scenario. Yeah, individual decisions require all the information that's difficult to make. Policy decisions have something different because there's techno technological advances and scientific advances that if you make a policy decision today, you may not think tomorrow. So I think you're right that policy can change the, we heard the other question too, research could change the next day there could be a discovery for the guy with cystic fibrosis. Right? We have people doing some fantastic work at Optics on cystic fibrosis. We could come up with some kind of intervention. So what you want to have is to build your policies typically in a procedural fashion that accommodates changes in technology, changes in diseases and the like. That's hard to do, but we want to be sensitive to that. And one more question? No, can I? Well, oh, yes. well, people can raise hands, but let me add to that. So there's an example exactly to your point. We now are changing the way we allocate kidneys for transplant because people realize that we were putting kidneys from very young people into very old people. As we all get older, we think that's not so bad. But <laughs> if you're thinking about how to get the maximum number of life years saved for kidney transplant, that's not, that's not smart to have that kind of disconnect. So now there's a policy that's making its way through a very clear process that will change the national approach to allocation such that we now won't have more than a 7 to 10 year gap between the age of the donor and the age of the recipient. So it, exactly to your, to your point, it, and, and to Jeremy's point, that we can change as we need to, but there should be clear procedural ways by which we do that. Okay, one more question? Okay, one more question right there, and we got it. Yeah, it's not really a question. Uh, really, uh, I want to um, ask the question, what, what is an acceptable human being? Is it a human being that's healthy, or is it a human being that, ha that has that even criteria? And I'm just going back to the, I can go back uh, even uh, further back, but I'm, I'm addressing the problem of fusionism and uh, the reality of what had been decided at the end of the 19th century. What is a valid human being? When shall we dis not disconnect the, 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 the health care, but when are we deciding that that's not an acceptable we might so, even kill them. So in these decisions, are there implicit ideas about what they should be when acceptable or not? I'm just saying it's a longer... Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're, you're, quite, you're quite right. So uh, we often start with <coughs> a very foundational moral principle, which is one of equal moral use. Equal moral worth. <laughs> equal moral Susan. worth. Susan, equal moral worth. And the, this is the notion that uh, can be grounded in, in both religious arguments and also in non-religious arguments focused on human dignity, but the notion is that each human being is of equal moral worth and ought to be treated equally with, res with respect to a, a bunch of criteria that I won't, uh, and conditions that I, I won't go through here. It will, it will take lecture for a living. Yeah, just start it and I'll be doing sort of, you know, 101 here. The, the challenge that you raise, that's a simple principle and it makes simply good sense, right? It makes moral good sense. When you get to edgy borderline cases, people begin to debate, right? How to think about whether someone or something still is a human being. <coughs> and it's not, uh, I don't mean this to be flip, but if you, if you take, for example, where Jeff was going with regard to when is a person dead, right? So is a person in certain states really still a human being? It's an important question to ask, right? Not whether someone is entitled to equal respect, but whether that something is still the kind of entity that demands respect. Uh, and this is a debate on the edges. It's not at the core, it's at the edges. It rarely comes up, but when it does, it's extremely difficult. Now, there, there have been horrible and dark times in the history of science and medicine in which people have argued that some uh, entities who are obviously human beings are not worthy or equal in their worth. That is thoroughly rejected now. 
hopefully permanently, at least in our field, right? And in you know, moral, practical moral philosophy, just generally. Whether there aren't contexts in which, and communities in which, that dark and horrible view continues, I'm not disputing, right? But it's not the way in which we operate. All right, well, on that dark note, let's uh, <laughs> move on to the next scenario. Get your clickers ready. Our next topic is big data. New parents are a retailer's holy grail. Parents' lives have changed. They're panicking. And what are they going to do? They'll shop. Target's marketing team wanted to beat the rush and reach out to expectant mothers in their second trimester, ahead of the competition. For decades, Target, like other retailers, has collected vast amounts of data on regular shoppers, combining details about preferences and shopping habits with demographic information. So there was an article about this in a New York Times magazine in 2012. Target identified some 25 products <coughs> things like unscented lotion and cotton balls, that when examined together, could be used to assign each shopper a pregnancy prediction score, <laughs> along with a fairly accurate estimate of a due date. <laughs> About a year after launching this pregnancy prediction model, a customer walked into a Target store demanding to see the manager. He had coupons that had been sent to his daughter, and he was angry. He said, she's still in high school, and you're sending her coupons for baby clothes and cribs? Are you trying to encourage her to get pregnant? The manager apologized in person, and then called a few days later to apologize again. And the father said, I had a talk with my daughter. It turns out that she's due in August. <laughs> <laughs> so big data is everywhere, and we generate most of it ourselves. Many of us use social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. We post vast amounts of data, births, deaths, illnesses, preferences, complaints, habits, all freely shared and translated into digital from trail. There's also a staggering array of health and fitness apps, collecting and sharing data about diet, sleep, <coughs> exercise, heart rates, alcohol consumption, vision, and on and on and on. And now there's even wearable technology so that you'll never even have to be offline. To a large extent, the digital crumbs of our lives have been used to sell us things. But as data grow and connect, there are growing hopes that big data could be used for so much more, from better cities to better health. Mount Sinai Medical Center in Manhattan has hired Jeff Hammerbacher, Facebook's first data scientist, to develop techniques to link up their massive sources of data, like their extensive electronic medical records and their DNA biobank, to output predictions about their patients' health. Sinai is not alone in this endeavor. The cost of healthcare in the United States is a major concern and an escalating burden. Around the US, healthcare providers are betting that big data will become an invaluable tool for controlling costs and improving quality. Another big data bet is being made in the area of brain mapping. This year, both the European Union and the United States have committed to billion dollar, decade long projects to improve our understanding of how the brain works. Brain mapping promises to finally reveal the mechanisms behind how we think and feel, opening a door to both increased understanding and potential interventions. It's a massive endeavor. Mapping just one cubic millimeter of brain will generate 2,000 terabytes of information. If successful, we will have a new and different trail of digital crumbs that can be merged in with the rest of big data. So, we have big data growing all around us, enormously promising data, but that data may also come at a price beyond the billions of dollars invested in research. Let's see what you think. So the first question, pretty simple. <laughs> Is privacy dead, yes or no? Second question. A major healthcare system has built a big data set that combines DNA data with electronic medical records. They find a gene that is associated in certain patients with an increased risk of developing a rare, untreatable, and deadly disease. Not all of these patients will develop the disease, but the risk is increased. Should the healthcare system contact these patients to share this information?
is question three. Through brain mapping research, we find that using a particular type of brain scan, we can predict which individuals are more likely to be dishonest. A government agency would like to use this information to screen employees who work with sensitive and classified information. Should this government agency be allowed to screen employees using this brain scan? privacy, a, a lot, sometimes nuance is wonderful, but sometimes things come down to you either want it or you don't. If you want it, you have to protect it. And so every time this, that question came up, I was a no, because I want to protect privacy. All right, one more comment. We'll the, the, the question is whether the individual should be notified of his chance of getting this disease? And I think the question answer is yes, but if his potential employer wants to know it, then no.
commit to living their lives openly, online, in, in a way that's very, even more radically oriented towards openness, right, than the way we've been talking about it. Um, so they tend to be kind of the Google generation, and they tend to be more West Coast, frankly. Um, but there's a whole crowd of, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I can say that. Um, but there's a, a, a organization called Sage Bio Network in Seattle which actually has committed to um, l allowing researchers, so to bring it back to the biomedical research context, allowing uh, res any researcher who wants to access this very large and growing data set about individuals with everything from their medical history to their what they ate for lunch yesterday, uh, in this data set, so long as the researchers commit to respecting certain terms, right, so that they, they won't disclose the identity of individuals. And there's a long list of things that they have to agree to. But in return for that, the individuals feel like there's enough good to be gained to share their information in ways that we would think of as being <coughs> radically not private, right? radically public. So I, I think it's, you know, we're speaking a bit in generality, but I think that there are, are individuals who are thinking really differently about privacy than has ever been true in the past. Well, let me ask you a question that has to do also with privacy in terms of thinking about information, our information whether or not we share it. That's how mostly people think about privacy. You know, I have this information, should I share it? But it seems like in the world of big data, um, companies and healthcare organizations are in a position of perhaps knowing things about us that we could not know about ourselves um, and would never even think to ask about ourselves, potentially. And so how do we think about privacy with that type of information? So you might want to think about where the situation started with the Target story, and that's a real story. So Target is not, last time I checked, although it could be any day now, a healthcare provider who sells everything else. Am I open up a video? That wasn't the context. All right, there you go. Sorry about that. But the point is, they get all, that shows you how often I shop at Target. But, uh, but, but the point being, it illustrates what Nell is suggesting. Right? These are retailers. They know tons about us, tons about us. Uh, we were talking recently to a, an ethics and big data colleague about how to think about ethics in the context of all of the information that's being generated in medicine, high end science, and electronic health records. And I remember I was really struck by her comment, which is, look, I worry a whole lot more about Google. So every time you Google search something, Somebody knows that, right? And often we Google search medical conditions that we think we have or that we're worried we might have or that someone we care about might have. We're trying to understand it. It may not be useful information. It may be terribly important information. But the point is somewhere you're leaving that data crumb that you're interested in constipation, right? Or you're interested in brain tumors. You're interested in it for a reason. And people can put the dots together, they put the dots together, and they can infer all kinds of things about who we are and, and what's wrong with us, so, uh, or what we might, might be wrong with us. So one of the core questions I think we all have to face is how we fit in worries about privacy and control over things that are obvious, like our personal electronic health record, with the things about our health and our private lives, which we still might want to think of as private, that ordinarily are kind of out of sight, out of mind. You Google something, you put it away, you don't realize you're leaving a trace. Okay, so, so the excitement about big data in healthcare is that there are going to be discoveries of things, human disease, suffering, conditions, that there is absolutely no other way we could do sort of the new Framingham study, you know, following a cohort of people over time and taking their bloods and reading blood and doing exams regularly. We can't do that. And the fact that industry has preceded healthcare in this is not surprising. And the fact that, that the ability to use this information is extraordinarily powerful and it's exciting. The big concern is the one about privacy for the pieces of the health record that are needed to put those pieces together. So in terms of what our ethical worries are, the ethical worry is, do they infringe on things like employment, as you pointed out? Returning results to people before they're completely baked. It's one thing for Amazon to send you an announcement that since you bought this kind of 
camera, you might want this sort of chip and this sort of cover. You say, oh, that's nice. I forgot about that. Let me click through. Versus the same information in healthcare, when do you want that back? And we want to start thinking about when can we take that link that we've gotten rid of to protect people's privacy and then establish those links again or, or maintain them to be ordered to actually then return results to people. That's where the challenges are, when it poses harms. Yeah, let me, let me just pick up on that. Um, I think that not that many people, so while you might like the, uh, it, the nice thing that Amazon reminded you that you could get a new lens or a chip, it's not service and important in any large sense, and I think we all relate to that um, with marketing. With health, it's really different. Um, so Luke <coughs> and I are running a project right now where we're going to groups of people, to patients from a couple different healthcare systems, and walking through, to some degree, the amount of control people want um, to be able to say yes or no to their information being used. For example, in a research study that is simply looking at the medical records of the care they already got to see what kinds of interventions for, let's say, your back pain seem to have worked and which ones didn't seem to work. And again, how much control people want over being able to say yes or no, you may or may not look at my records for the care I already got. What's interesting and what's built into the design of this project is the more we talk to people about the trade-off, in other words, if you say to people, how do you feel about people going through your medical records? <laughs> Not a lot of people say I'm excited about that. <laughs> but if you say to people, what if, um, what if it were really true, which it happens to be true, that we still don't know for most people whether surgery or physical therapy is better for a lot of kinds of back pain. And if it were true that we could look through the experience of the tens of thousands of people who've had different scenarios and get some really smart people to look at that data and start to get a better sense of which kinds of people do better with surgery, which kinds of people do better with PT, and which kinds of people it really makes no difference, would that make any difference in how you feel about it? Well, let's take a couple questions, but then I want to make sure we have room, uh, time left for the last scenario. So I see um, someone's been waiting patiently in the back there. So as far as the whole privacy, especially when it comes to the uh, gene question, is at what age do you make that decision to tell people? Because especially, for example, with kids and the Huntington scenario, you know, most geneticists will actually tell you, sorry, I'm not going to do this test because it's something that may or may not occur, it's something that may or may not be, may or may not kill her and affect the rest of her life, and we don't want you waiting in fear. So when do you make that determination? So, and, and who makes the determination, I guess? I guess that gets in the issue of when it comes to information about you, who gets to decide what you know? So, um, so it's, first of all, Always convenient if you could have a conversation before you do a test, rather than before you do that, have a result that you're deciding to give back on. Right? Sometimes you come across results incidentally. Right? You're doing a scan for a really important clinical purpose, and you come across something else, and you have to decide whether or not to disclose it. But um, and while that could happen increasingly with genetics, there are a lot of scenarios like the way you're describing, where really part of the decision is should you even do this test. And at least you're in a better situation there than when you're holding something in your medical chart and it's sort of a, yes, this person has this risk or this gene or this something, and it's a, again, it's a, the stakes are a lot, a lot um, higher there. Right. So, so the risk of a life-threatening disease, we need a little bit more information about what that is. So if it's a risk of life-threatening disease that would be far in the future, where there's no intervention that you can change is a very different situation than you have a life-threatening disease, but if you intervene now, we can do something about it, right? So what we want to know is, given the state of the science at the time and what we know about um, the disease, that will play a role, as would if we had the luxury of testing in the old sort of old-fashioned gene testing where we knew we were testing you for this gene. We'd know people's preferences for that information. Generally, the, the sort of party line has been that we don't test children for genetic diseases unless there are things that we can intervene on during childhood, right? So if there are mm -hmm. adult onset disorders, such as 
the, you might have heard of the BRCA1, BRCA2, the, the genes that uh, make you more susceptible to breast and ovarian cancer. Those, we say, there's nothing to do differently in childhood. So we wait for that sort of testing so a person, once they become adults, can make decisions for themselves. Whereas for um, things that um, pose a risk, for um, you can on the back of your, um, if you're drinking a, a can of uh, Coke or something, it says phenylketonurics, beware. We screen, we do that screen at birth because we can intervene to ensure the well-being of that child. So to, to play this forward a little bit, we're now, uh, NIH is funding a series of projects to discuss both the technical and clinical and ethical issues related to replacing the newborn screen with whole genome sequencing. So it's getting to the point where the cost of just doing genome sequencing on a baby is, is going to be as cheap or maybe less expensive than the way we do testing now for the kinds of diseases that Jeremy just articulated. So, so now we're, if that happens, and there's discussion about whether it should, but let's just play it forward and say it is implemented. We're now in a, a more like an Amazon world, right, where we know your genome from the time that you're born, and we have to make a decision about when to reach out to you and say, hey, hey, um, maybe it's time to think about buying a new lens for that camera. But it's really, instead of a camera, it's about, hey, hey, we just found out that there's a, a, a connection between this particular mutation that you happen to have and your potential for developing a particular disease in the future. We have to, it's not like the testing and talking in advance model about what, what needs to be disclosed and when tests need to be ordered. And so we really have to think kind of paradigmatically differently about the test result model than we have in the past. All right, I think we have to leave that there because we need to move on to the next scenario, which I think you all will enjoy. So get out your little clickers. Our final topic today is enhancement. Many of you have likely heard about enhancement in sports. Uh, Lance Armstrong, the now routinely booed Alex Rodriguez. Um, and then there's Don Ramos. He's 80 years old and holds several world records for weightlifting for his age group. He can still lift 160 pounds over his head. After a competition, his testosterone levels were found to be twice the typical level for a man his age. He was declared a cheat by the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. Now, he freely admits taking synthetic testosterone. He's been taking it for 20 years with a prescription from his doctor. Hormone replacement is common enough, even among aging men who aren't in weightlifting competitions. You've likely seen ads for low T and treatments that can help you get back in the game. This line between treatment and enhancement is also hard to define for stimulants like Ritalin and Adderall, which are widely prescribed for children with ADHD. Some young people also use these drugs in hopes of improving their academic performance. Pilots use modafinil to stay alert and accurate on long missions. Devices using magnetic fields to induce electrical currents in the brain have been shown to perform like real life thinking caps, improving cognitive performance. Propranolol, a common heart drug, which is also sometimes used to treat anxiety, might serve as a moral enhancer. Participants in a study were randomly assigned to take either this drug or a placebo pill Participants who took the drug scored less racially prejudiced on a racial implicit association test than those who took the placebo. Did the drug make them less racist? <coughs> it's interesting, but I don't think we're ready to put this in the water supply just yet. <laughs> a device that delivers a low current to specific areas of the brain has been shown to impact compliance with social norms. In this particular study, fairness. Moral enhancement isn't entirely new. Chemical castration has been offered as a controversial treatment for sex offenders. Groups like DARPA with the military have long been interested in what might actually be considered moral dehancing soldiers, increasing aggression, reducing fear, or erasing traumatic memories. Going beyond drugs and devices, different forms of enhancement might be possible through genetic engineering. 
Genetic engineering could allow corrections for traits that would result in disabilities. It might also allow us to select for certain traits like height, strength, cognitive ability, empathy. Someday, we might even be able to manipulate genes to confer abilities that go beyond those of typical humans. New humans who require less food or with an ability to see in very low light, enhancements that could help us combat climate change. So, lots to think about here. Let's see what you think. First question simple. Is enhancement cheating? called Cognify. It's been shown to greatly increase cognitive performance. Patients report massively increased ability to pay attention for long periods, but also they report the loss of the sort of creativity that they previously had. There are no reports of other serious side effects. Would you take Cognify to improve your cognitive performance? So here's another new drug. You have three young children and a spouse to whom you've been married for seven years. Your relationship is trouble. You and your spouse have been in counseling together, but divorce seems imminent. Your counselor tells you about a new drug that might help. Oxymate has been shown to deepen romantic <laughs> save a marriage, what would it do biologically to a person? Oh, um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that makes a difference. It's, oxy it's it oxy a difference to you? What do you care? <laughs> what do I care? If it's going to do something harmful to me, then I might not want to take it. No, there's no serious side effects. It just deepens your romantic feelings. So would you take it? Love you. Yeah. 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 Is there someone who wouldn't take it? I would not take it simply because I don't think it solves the problems that led to the difficulties of the marriage in the first place. Um, My other question, in particular, uh, in relation to this one, is: Okay, you say it enhances your your romantic feelings. What about to the hot guy that you work with? <laughs> <laughs>
working really hard to be able to save money for our children to do that are enhancements. So maybe the question is, is it different when it's a pharmacologic enhancement? But of course, we do that all the time with all sorts of things as well. So I think to sort of have a yes, no question, is enhancement a morally bad thing, which is essentially what cheating implies? Of course not. There are sometimes when there's going to be rules of a game, right? So if you say for this weightlifting competition you're not allowed to use an enhancement, and someone does, they've broken the rules of the game. In the same way that if I offer, if I do a closed book final exam and a student uses her notes, she's broken the rules of the game. There's nothing inherently morally wrong with using notes. Well, I, I think Nancy said it very well. We want to take the, the term enhancement is itself in our world we would call a morally neutral term. It's a description. Okay? It's not necessarily good or bad until you know the context in which it could be used. And, and it, in, by itself, there's nothing wrong with it. To enhance things is a good thing. If you think about the root, right? To enhance is to make better, is to improve. So um, why do you say it's morally neutral? It's morally neutral. If you just said it makes it, it implies well, better. Well, but you're good, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's part of the problem with language. But it is. It, is, it comes from a root which is good, right, to enhance. But the, the way we use the term today in enhancement is just, it's, it's what you do. It's a, a thing that is done. And whether it's good or bad depends on the context, the purpose, the risk, and a whole bunch of other things. Nancy hit on a key word, which is cheating, right? When you have rules of the game and you use a, anything to get an unfair advantage that breaks the rules, that's bad, right? Uh, and that, I mean, that's a wrong thing to do. In general, so that's that's where we start to think about enhancements. But you've got a line between enhancements and advantage. We all do things to get advantage, to get advantages in life. We try to get advantages for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren. It's part of part of the social drive to have a good life, to succeed, to experience happiness, well-being for ourselves and for the people that we love. The line is between advantage of the sort that is fair and the kind of advantage that actually systematically disadvantages other people. Is everybody with me? And, and an enhancement that works to my favor right, in ways that actually makes it harder for other people to experience what we all want, that becomes morally problematic. Scientifically based on Pardon? Scientifically based beauty products. I just have a seminar recently about some stem cell technology that can apply to beauty products. It's very expensive. So does that confer an unfair advantage to those who are important? Well, so it's a really interesting question. I'll let somebody else speak. But we think about the whole world of aesthetic dermatology and aesthetic plastic surgery. There's also the case that when people are born good looking, they're advantaged. It's, it's a good thing. You see the baby and the child, and you say, my God, the child's so lucky. It's attractive, right? You know that it's going to help them their whole lives if they're good looking. It's never going to. So what difference does it make? And this is when we get to the morally tough part. If the, the child was just born lucky and is beautiful or attractive or whatever the term is, or in fact efforts were made to buy products with stem cell stuff in them or dermatology or whatever is done, and that child races. All right, we can go down the list. I mean, some, some dental work is clearly important to get the teeth to work right, but after a certain point, let's face it, we're going for perfect, right? To click the, you know, the chick with the smile, that kind of thing. I'll stop. So let's, let's have your, your all's views on Oxymate, since that seems to really get people. I guess the question is, what, as an ethicist, thinking about Oxymate, what, are your, what do you think are the key issues that a, a spouse in that situation should what are the values or the considerations or the things to weigh when deciding whether or not to take a drug like that? An enhancement drug for something as personal as your romantic relationship with your spouse? Well, I, I feel like I'm talking a lot, but... So, 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 so. <laughs> let the guys talk for a change, come on. It's gender-based. Children matter here. So, children, 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 children. so, so let me just uh, let me pick up on this piece, and we'll we'll come to your come to your point. I think for the 
perspective, first of all, is, is we believe this new drug, Oxymate, through Nell's interpretation, increases romantic uh, attraction for your partner. And we might have the unintended consequences, <laughs> adverse or, 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 or beneficial, to be attracted. When you come to our workplace, we, we'd love for more people to go, you know, it's just a, we'd be great. But um, we don't know the unintended consequences, right? So we don't know the risk to self, we don't know the risk to others, we don't know the social consequences, we don't know what the root cause is of the problems with the marriage. It makes an assumption of marriage um, uh, that the marriage is based on romance. That's a very Western, Northern view of marriage, mm -hmm. and that the most important part of maintaining that marriage is related to um, a romantic attraction. It may be something completely different. There may be hazards of being romantically entranced with someone who is not a good person or behaving poorly. And so what you want to do is make this a bit more complicated and, and to think through what are the implications and, and what would this drug do and, and to believe that we have the hubris to understand that a pill would fix a marriage is, is really funny to me. Um, and so those are the kinds of worries where you want to try to make this a bit harder. You might parse this according to what your definition of marriage is. You may parse this according to children. You may parse it to a variety of things. So I, I think that this one is, is, is um, important to think through in that sort of way. So I have a different reaction, which is this sounds a lot like me to other kinds of psychological problems that we try to address by giving people pills. Right? And we, we can think of a lot of those things in our lives or in the lives of people. Uh, SRIs, one might categorize in a similar way. Whoever started the conversation by saying, I think it's a problem to give people a pill for something that doesn't address the root issue. I think that's how you say it, the root psychological issue. There's a lot of, of SSRI uh, prescription in the US for sure to make people feel better without getting at the root cause about why they don't feel the way that we think that they should. So it's interesting to me that we're having this reaction to oxymate, but we're not having this reaction to fill in the blank. And there's a whole bunch of drugs that fall into that category. So, so um, I guess I'm, I'm less shocked by the prospect of oxymate, but maybe I'm more shocked by the reaction to it than, I, than we have to things like all the psychological psychoactive drugs that are being prescribed in, in our country now. Yeah, my question is, uh, <clears throat> I went to Hopkins and the fraternity rushed a uh, certain freshman, and one argument was, you're in our frat, and we have expensive files on old exams, and this will give you an edge or advantage. And I'm wondering, uh, <laughs> has a study ever been done that uh, people that belong to frats is better than the ones who didn't? <laughs> you know, because having a little bit of that, Thanks for the confession. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us.